Good morning, everyone. Thank you if you're joining us online. Please let us know what city or state you're tuning in from in the chat box. We're going to officially get started in about four minutes. Tuning in from Montreal, Wichita, Kansas. Great. So now we can say this is an international event. <laughs> That's right. My mom is on here, but she's not chatting. Mom, do you know how to write in the chat box at the bottom there? Hi, Pamela's mom. <laughs> if you don't, if you look at the bottom of the screen, right under the faces, there'll be a line of icons that say security participants and then chat. Chris, can we get you to turn off your video, please? Thank you. And in the chat box, if you click that, everyone will be able to chat with each other and see each other's comments and questions. I have to get my friend, so I'm not going anywhere. One second. All right. We can't have the event without Amy. Don't worry about it if your camera comes on. I'm sure there will be more than one person. Oh, and we have Tucker joining us. <laughs> Very handsome Tucker. I've got my Tucker here too. Tucker, hop up. Tucker. He's sleeping. Come on, wake up. <laughs> I saw Tucker had a, your Tucker had a lot of fun in the pool. He did. He loves children. And so that was a very good afternoon. And he was so gentle with the little tiny girls. It was great because he hasn't been around little people very much. Oh, right. great. Loretta Ellsworth is joining us. Welcome, Loretta. She's another author. I love Chris's absolute freaking lutely. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I said not to worry. I'm sure we'll have more than one person. I did that on an event, turned on my camera, and there was about 500 people on it, so that was embarrassing. But everyone's figuring out Zoom as we go here. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Great, we're getting a nice sized audience here. And I'm sure we'll have a thousand more people who turn tune in to the video recording. Hello, Susie. Susie, can we get you to turn off your video camera too, please? Thank you. Is Susie a friend of yours? She is. She's a wonderful writer. Oh, All right. right. A wonderful book. Here, um, Andrew, do you want to take this little guy? I'm handing this guy off to my... Bye, Tucker. Um, here you go. Susie wrote many books, um, one of which was The Subway Girls that I loved, but this is her most recent. Right, I've been seeing great publicity for that one. Congratulations. It's to shine. It is so much fun and it's so good. And you'll learn so much about the New York World's Fair, which I knew nothing about. Oh, I really didn't. I mean, I knew what it was, but I didn't know much about it. Right. And she gives you a map in the beginning and you see all these photographs and um, you just get to learn all the ins and outs. And it was just this amazing thing. So, um, and plus the book has a great storyline. So hi Susie, highly recommend your book. I see we've also got author Gretchen Anthony on the program and she has a brand new book coming out called The Kids Are Gonna Ask. And Loretta Ellsworth was here. So oh, it's 11 o'clock, which means it's showtime. Nifty. So for all of you who know Amy, you know she's a wonderful writer. If you do not know Amy, she is the author of Small Admissions and Limelight. And I had the pleasure of hosting her here in Minnesota last November at Literature Lovers Night Out. And she was a big hit in both uh, Excelsior, where we had the luncheon at Hazeltine Golf Club, and in Stillwater, where Valley Booksellers hosted her. 
We had a wonderful time and she sold a zillion books and we're so excited to now be able to have her virtually here for the release of Musical Chairs, which comes out on Janu or January, July 21st. So welcome, Amy, and thank you to everyone who's tuned in today. Thank you so much, Pamela. And I didn't, I just missed the last thing that you said. I said that we, your book comes out on July the 21st. Yes. Musical Chairs. Yes. And everybody can pre-order it. I'm going to put the link in right now, and you can order it from either Valley Bookseller in Stillwater or Excelsior Bay Books in Excelsior, Minnesota. And they will be happy to get you a copy so that it's ready and waiting for you on release day or have it sent to you. And you can pick it up in the store or curbside. But go ahead and pre-order and you will get a special treat from Amy. Amy, you want to tell us what that is? Well, we're going to have signed book plates that are absolutely adorable. I just found them. I mean, they just arrived and I'm signing away and they are really, really nice. And of course, a bookmark as well. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Excelsior Bay and to Valley Bookseller for having me. And of course, to Pamela, who I feel like I know so well now, <laughs> not only because our dogs have the same name, but um, because I have stayed with her. And, and we had so much fun. <laughs> fun and she's just an amazing virtual host and she's an amazing real life host so thank you you were very kindly hosted a literary party when i was in new york right before the world shut down amazing i know we were lucky That's to squeeze that in we were that was one of the last social things that i did before all of this happened um and it was really fun it was so much fun to bring everybody together so it well, really was thank you for hosting that so yeah. tell us all now about the latest book, Musical Chairs. Okay, so this is my book, Musical Chairs, that as Pamela said, it's gonna be out July 21st. Um, yeah. I started writing this book um, uh, in part because I wanted to explore this idea of adult children moving back home. I did not know when I wrote the book that we were going to be hit with a pandemic and that all three of my adult children would move back home. So that's just a little bit of, um, life imitating art in the case of my life. So that was a little bit crazy. Um, I also wanted to write about a woman in her 50s who goes to her sort of dilapidated weekend house and she's planning to spend the entire summer there. Um, again, didn't know that I was gonna be moving out to my dilapidated weekend house and spending the entire summer here with my adult children. So, um, that's what sort of prompted me to do the book trailer because I wanted to sort of explore this idea of whether or not there are autobiographical elements to the story. Should I show it to you? Go ahead because people have to see this. It really should win an Academy Award for book trailers. It's excellent. <laughs> well, it was a lot of fun to make. I have to tell you, we had a really, really good time. Um, and I will just hit play and you'll learn a bit about me, a bit about my kids and a bit about the book maybe. Here it is. What? Okay, this is funny. Somebody just wrote that they think that my book is really autobiographical. That's ridiculous. But isn't it a book about New Yorkers who have a house in Connecticut? And all the adult kids move back home? What? No, yes, but they're twins. She has a daughter. I don't have a daughter. Yeah, but isn't the house room like completely falling apart? <laughs> I thought they were all musicians. Don't they bring all their pets? Doesn't the mom drink a lot of wine? No, this is fiction. I'm a novelist. There we are. Well done. That was fantastic. 
So Inside Scoop, my son almost lost an eye filming that little scene with the cat. She's wild and does not like to be held, especially when she's outside. So that was a little exciting. <laughs> um, and tennis courts are not supposed to look like that. So yeah, I just thought since I'm out here and I'm not going to be on tour with this book, I said to my entire family, I've got this idea. Would you help me with something? And they were great. Everybody pitched in. So. They were. That was really fantastic. Well, you want to talk a little bit more about musical chairs and what got you going with writing? Absolutely. So as I said, I was thinking about country houses. I was thinking about bringing a whole family together, especially when not when you're not sort of expecting certain family members to be part of the summer plan. Um, I also wanted to, I was sort of thinking about this idea of a male-female friendship. And I always, you know, I was in that very important age when, when Harry Met Sally came out and they said men and women, well, Harry said men and women can't be friends because the sex always gets in the way. And I don't know, I just always thought about that. And of course, in the case of Harry and Sally, they, sex does get in the way and almost ruins their friendship. And then of course it ends up a romantic story. And I won't give spoilers in terms of what ends up happening with Will and Bridget, but I just liked this idea of, a man and a woman who are not only friends for a very, very long time, but who have a joint project together. And Bridget and Will have their piano trio, and they've been doing this since their days at Juilliard. So it was just um, a chance for me to sort of see if um, I could take that friendship and really do something with it, sort of explore it, and see whether or not, in the case of these two fictional characters, um, does the sex have to get in the way? So that's that's what um that's another sort of piece of the story that got me writing great well this book has not only will and bridget in it you have a huge cast of characters in this one when you're writing how do you manage to juggle all these people keep them very well de develop, developed and active in this book well, my writer friends who are on here know that, that it was not, this was not easy because I really did want, part of, the, of what I wanted this book to have was a big cast of characters. That was kind of important to me. But you're right. How do you keep them all weighted the way you want them? Who takes up the most real estate in the story and who takes up less and why? Is there a reason for that? Um, I, I ended up doing a draft that got just a massive revision. And part of what I really thought about as I was doing the revision was structure. And I sort of used the structure that I imposed on myself. The way if you're a poet, you might think, well, I'll write a sonnet. And that can be very limiting because you're going to stick to the structure. But it can also be very freeing because you're like, now I've got my rules. What can I do? How, what, how can I maximize what I can get out of this structure? So there's no reason the readers would notice this but it's written in trios. It's written in threes. So Bridget gets a chapter, Will gets a chapter, and then there's an empty chair, as it were. And each of those rounds of three, I wanted a different character to chime in and tell their piece of the story. But I didn't, I wanted it to really be very thoughtful in that they are the right person at this moment in the story to be chiming in and telling their part of it. So it was a challenge. It was a lot of fun. Um, the only character that I gave more weight to was Gavin, who was the original violinist in the trio. And um, the book is divided into thirds, June, July, and August. And he gets a chapter in each one. So that... Can you turn off your video? Thank you. <laughs> that was, um, a lot of... Oh, here's oh, Chris. She's back. <laughs> Let's see. There we um, go. So it, anyway, it was just a lot of fun to sort of think about writing in threes. I was sort of thinking like a waltz, and that way we would keep returning to Bridget and Will. So. Well, it worked masterfully. I know author Stephen, Stephen, Kier, Stephen Kiernan is wondering if you are a musician, and I wondered if you had a PhD oh. in music when I was reading this. You are such a wealth of musical knowledge. <laughs> I'm excited to see Stephen speaking with you, by the way. Is that tomorrow? Uh, no, that's coming up uh, the day after your book releases. Jul okay. July 22nd, Stephen and I will be in conversation about his new book, Universe of Two. Okay, well, I will be tuning into that. Um, but to answer your question, I don't have even 
a musical background or education or anything. So I had to do a lot of research. My um, kids are all very musical. They did not inherit this from me. I can't read music. I don't even have very good taste, actually. And um, I'll, I love to go to hear classical music. And you know, a week later, my son will say, wasn't that piece beautiful? And I won't remember, like I don't have an ear for it, but that doesn't mean I'm not an appreciator and it doesn't mean I can't do a lot of research. So I did a lot of research. Um, but my youngest went to a, an arts school um, forever and he's now studying composition and musicology at NYU. And I saw him and his classmates and it's, a, it's just, to me, it's just an interesting dynamic when you look at groups of musicians and is it competitive or is it supportive? And it's a very, you have to be very trusting of each other the way an acting group would have to be, a cast of a play would have to be trusting. Um, so I wanted to set these characters in that world and I didn't know how to do it. So um, originally it was a quartet. I decided I didn't want it to be a quartet. I liked this idea of threes. I think that's always an interesting dynamic when you get triangles in right. fiction. More tension. Yes, exactly. So at some point, the, the uh, quartet was dropped to a trio. I had to cut one of the members of the band, <laughs> as it were. Um, but anyway, that was it was fun, and I researched a lot. And I'm actually going to make a Spotify playlist of the music that's in the book. Oh, great. That'll be fabulous. Now, I know with Limelight, which takes place in Broadway, you live in New York. That was really easy for you to access this world as a, as a former actress yourself. Where did you go to do your research with all this music? Um, well, mostly my family. I got just an enormous amount of help, especially from Luke, my youngest. He was just incredible. Every time I said, this is where they are, what would they be listening to? And he would give me, you know, a piece or two for me to choose from. And um, that, that helped a lot. Um, I do love to go hear music. I don't um, recently, it just breaks my heart to think that the opera and the symphony, like, when are these things going to open again? I hope soon. Um, but I also went to Marsha Butler. She's a wonderful author who wrote a book called Pickle's Progress, and she wrote a memoir called The Skin Above Our Knees. I think I got that right. And she's a really generous, lovely, supportive author, as they all seem to be. I contacted her right around the time that I was writing the first draft. And what I wanted from her, because she was a professional oboist and she studied classical music herself, and I really wanted the details, like what's the travel schedule like for a group like this? And I explained to her exactly how successful I wanted them to be. They're not here, but they're not here. Like, so I sort of walked her through all of that and she would say to me, we gotta talk about money. Like, <laughs> what's your financial situation? Because that's really relevant, that's really important. Who's taking care of her kids while she's on tour? Like, so she raised a lot of questions that were really helpful for me. Um, so I'm very grateful to Marsha for her expertise on this subject. It was great. Can you type Marsha's name into the chat box so people have that in case they're interested in picking up a copy of Pickle's Progress or the skin above their knees. Is that correct? Yes. Um, Pickle's Progress. She's, and she's such a, she actually just moved out to New Mexico, I found out. Okay. Um, yes, there you go. Marsha Butler, Pickles Progress. Great. Thank you for that. Because people yes. might want to tune in. Okay, yeah. great. Now, in addition to this huge cast of human characters, <laughs> you have all these great animals. I know you and I are both dog lovers. We both have a dog named Tucker. Um, want to talk a little bit about the inspiration for the Cats, dogs, alpacas, <laughs> everything else in the, in the book. I got, a, I got a little carried away with the animals. I even have a parrot. Um, I wanted this parrot to sort of cause a little bit of a relationship issue for one of the characters. So again, I relied on an author, Kira Jane Buxton, who wrote an amazing book called Hollow Kingdom. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It's dark and hilarious. And sorry, while I'm typing, I can't do two things at the same time. Okay. <laughs> she's so great. Um, and she's just an expert on animal behavior, bird behavior. I said to her, I, I, I think I want a parrot. <laughs> and I need the parrot to do certain things for me in this narrative world. And can you help me? And I said, would, you know, would a parrot do this and that? And she 
guided me on parrot behavior. Cats, I'm pretty well versed on cats. I have um, a really awful cat, actually. I hope she can't hear me right now. She's right over there, actually. She's no, there's one cat at the country house right now? Um, no, well, yes, now there's one. There were two, because okay. when my 26-year-old my just went back to New York, and took his cat with him, but we did have two, and they don't get along, and they don't get along with the dog, and the dog doesn't get along with the cat, so nobody gets along. Um, and although my Tucker is tiny, I really love big dogs, and I Here's love- my Tucker. I don't know if you could, I can get him on the screen or not. Come here, Tucker. And he loves Amy. Here he is. Hi, Tucker. Hi. <laughs> You're on TV. <laughs> Yeah, so I have um, I have two labs and a Newfoundland in the book, and yeah, and two cats. Uh, and Hadley and Bear, correct? Yep. Yeah. And Hadley and <laughs> Little are my two cats, and uh, and then I have my parrot. So yeah, lots of lots of pets. If you're going to come out to the country and you know crash in on your mom's house, you should bring your pets and your dirty laundry and your. <laughs> Always the dirty laundry. Now, do you really have an alpaca farm near you? Yes, we do. It's actually very, very near here. There's, um, it's about maybe two miles from my house. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. I don't know them, but I wave at the alpacas whenever I drive by. They're very funny. If so anybody fun. who's listening in has questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box and Amy can answer. Yes. And I know she's probably happy to take questions not only about musical chairs, but about her earlier two books. Do you want to talk about those two? Yes, I first have to say hi to Marcy, who just says that I do often insult my cat. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with really nice cats. I didn't know a bad cat. Everyone would talk about how they didn't like cats, and I never understood that because I've always had wonderful, loving cats. And then I ended up with this cat who's just vicious i mean she's, i don't know what happened to her child and childhood that made her this she's one of those hot and cold cats she'll be sweet and want you to pat her and then she'll she like goes crazy some wire crosses and she attacks you so um yes that's true and marcy also wrote a connecticut book very nice which is one of my all-time favorite books yeah, um, it just came out in paperback a week or two ago congratulations marcy Dramansky. very nice if anybody wants to pick up a copy of that one and it's got the most wonderful paperback cover. Um, so it's great. And what did you just ask me? I forgot. I one. said, did you want to give people a little hint about what your last two novels involved? Yes. So my last book was called Limelight. And this book was really fun to write. It's about a mom from Texas who moves to New York with her children and comes across a teenage pop star named Carter Reed, who's been cast in this big Broadway musical. And he's, if you think sort of Lindsay Lohan back in the day when she was, um, you know, not her best self, we might say, <laughs> or Justin Bieber. Um, and they don't, you know, I, this guy, this, this pop star doesn't understand the notion of sort of working as an ensemble. Um, he can't memorize his lines. He's a very good singer and dancer, but the, the structure of the schedule for Broadway and just the attitude of being sort of a team player is really foreign to him. So he struggles and she's there to kind of help him and it's a comedy. And I got to sort of write a Broadway musical in my head based on the Charlie, the Charlie Chaplin film, Limelight. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And before that, my first book, which came out just around the time I turned 50, um, was Small Admissions. And this book is very close to my heart because I was working in an admissions department when I wrote this book and interviewing hundreds and hundreds of applicant families. And I just wanted to sort of take a deep dive into that New York City private school admission scene, which is a little bit of a world in and of itself. It's a little insane um, and fun. And a girl who ends up with a job there who's a little incompetent as she starts out and her life is kind of falling apart. But it's a, I hope, a feel good story and that you get to watch, get her act like that. I just read Queenie. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know where Queenie is. Oh, it's way over there. You can't see it. Um, <laughs> Queenie uh, by Candace Carty Williams. And that's another book with a main character who is really making some bad decisions and who you end up just rooting for and you get to see her make some a really amazing transformation 
Um, so I've won all kinds of awards in the UK for that novel, yeah. and I believe it just came out in paperback as well. So yeah. I just want to give a shout out again. That was Queenie by Queenie's Queenie by Candace Cardi Williams. Um, I tip this one. Maybe you can see that bright orange book in the back there. I don't know if you I can, can see it. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question from the audience saying, "Who was your favorite character to write?" In Musical Chairs, it's probably going to surprise you, um, in Musical Chairs, there is a character named Jackie who comes in maybe uh, about six chapters into the book. The reason Jackie was so much fun for me to write is because I sort of knew all the characters at that point, and I decided to bring in an outsider. So I got to see my main characters again for the first time through the eyes of somebody who doesn't really fit in with the family. She's not a member of the family. She's never been to this place before. Um, and getting to see the characters the way she would see them was just so much fun for me. It was actually really helpful too, because I got to sort of, um, you know, just make some adjustments as I sort of thought, how would she perceive this place and these people and their wealth? and their attitudes and what would that be like coming from her. And then um, I guess this wasn't the nicest thing I could have done, but I had her drink a little bit too much. She has, she's that dinner party drink. is hysterical. <laughs> I mean, I'm not above that sort of thing of going to an important function and in the stress of it all, ending up maybe having a cocktail more than you should and wishing you hadn't. So I just wanted her to be uncomfortable and then to make her sort of more uncomfortable, which I admit wasn't very nice to do, but, um, but it was just, she was just kind of like, just as I was writing to me, she felt like a breath of fresh air to bring this other perspective into the story. She so, was a great character. I really enjoyed the scenes where Jackie was there, especially turning up to the country house in a formal pantsuit, ready yeah. for business. Yes. And everybody else is in their country clothing. <laughs> it feels like she looks, she thinks she's dressed like she's walking into an insurance firm or something. It, you know, <laughs> um, it's just she gets it completely wrong. But that was that was a lot of fun to to get to write her. I really yeah. enjoyed it. And watching her transformation, she changes a bit through the course of the book. Yes, uh, as they all do. It's wonderful. Uh, we've got another question. Someone's asking about your favorite character from all three of your novels. I'm gonna say. I'm going to say Will. Oh, okay. I think Will is maybe my favorite character. He's kind of the way I picture my youngest son, um, you know, 25, 30 years from now. He's a really decent person. He's a really good person. He has a sense of humor. He um, is, uh, lives alone and really has only himself to take care of, but he's been really adopted into Bridget's family. And he takes that role very seriously. He feels that he... Um, should be a good person and he should be a loyal friend and he should be a considerate house guest and he's just a really lovely man and he i enjoyed writing him um, nice um, labrador retriever so. yeah, yeah gavin is the um the, the original violinist and he was a prodigy as a kid and that was really fun to sort of write because he's one of those people who um is really insecure and the way he deals with it is by being really arrogant which i always find is such an interesting thing that people do um to sort of mask your insecurity by being really sort of cocky and unbearable um so he was a lot of fun to write too but i think of, even of all three books i think bridget and will maybe it's just because they're so close to me right now but um i really enjoyed i i like both of them a lot yeah. <laughs> dynamic between the two characters was just wonderful very heartwarming, but you could see that when they disagreed, it would be really difficult, but that there was a lot of love between the two of them, no matter what happened. Right. And so a lot of, a lot at stake. If something goes wrong between them, like what I would like the reader to feel is that that's going to be a loss. That would really be a terrible loss. It so. was. Especially since Will and Effects help, help raises the twins, even though he's not the father. Right, exactly. And feels very much like he has a paternal role with them. Um, and it was also really fun to write Bridget's father. I mean, he's Edmund's very, wonderful. <laughs> very pompous and he's very, um, he's a little narcissistic and he's very talented. Um, but uh, there's that he, his voice 
comes through at the very end of the book in the form of a speech. And he is a speech maker. He, there's nothing this man loves more than to command an audience and make a speech. So when I was ready to sort of bring him into the story, I was like, that's a no brainer. It, his has to come first person making a toast. And so that's what I, that's what I did with him. So getting to get his voice was a lot of fun. I like that he got his own font as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is important. You get your own font. <laughs> Amy, Christine is asking, what are you currently reading or something recently you've enjoyed reading? Gosh, so many things. I, so I have not been so great at focusing. I don't know about everybody else, but it's, it, it really sort of took me a while. I struggle to get myself to focus to write, although I have been writing, which I'm happy about. Um, but reading has not been a problem. And it's, um, for, I guess it's because I just need that escape right now. But also I've been taking a lot of really long walks, like five mile, six mile walks. And I have gotten to be the biggest fan of audiobooks in the world. So if I'm ever having an issue where I can't quite focus on a story, I'll start with the audiobook, And sometimes I'll have the Kindle already or um, other way around. But if I start by listening while I walk, I don't realize I'm exercising, which is a bonus, and I can really get lost in a story. Um, I read Wild Game recently um, by Adrienne Brodeur. It's her memoir. It's beautifully written. I loved it. It was really well told. Um, so my, my two-read pile right now, I'm about to start Jamie Brenner's book, which I'm- oh, Perfect for summer. Yep, super excited about, and- Ooh, that's and wonderful. I'm so excited to dive into this. We were fortunate to host Courtney Sullivan at Literature Lovers. Oh, fun. And yeah. her novel is a gem. So. I am the biggest Terry McMillan fan in the world, and I loved her book, It's Not All Down Here From Here. It's downhill from here. She does groups of women like nobody else. I mean, there's just nothing. You just want to be part of her lady friend groups when in her books. I just love them. <laughs> if you liked Waiting to Exhale, that's, you know, if you like, if you like Terry McMillan, this one is a gem. I love that the main characters are, um, the main character of this book is, it, it begins as she's about to turn 68. It's her 68th birthday. So it's an older group of women, uh -huh. um, which, and I just, I love that. I, it's great. And I just finished this book, and I'll explain why I chose this one in a minute, but this is a really quick, short, wonderful book by, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, but by Hanif Qureshi. I loved The Buddha of Suburbia. And this is a first person, a really one of those well done first person narratives where you just fall into this guy's mind and learn how he thinks. And last one I'll tell you about is American Spy. Um, this book, is such a surprise because it is a spy story and you learn a lot of history. It's also a romance. It's also a mother story. It's also a friend story. It's also, um, uh, it's just, it's one of those books that has sort of every genre in it. And it's so well written and it's fantastic. So Lauren Wilkinson, American Spy, um, prepare to be just swept away. Thank you for those recommendations. We're coming to the end of our time here, but I want to encourage everyone, I'll put it in the chat bar again, you can pre-order the book at either Valley Bookseller or Excelsior Bay Books. The links are right there, you, or you can call the stores and you will get a signed book plate and bookmark from Amy. And you can pick the book up on the day it releases, July 21st, or it can be shipped to your home. We will be back on July 22nd with author Stephen Kiernan to discuss Universe of Two. And we had quite a few people who didn't um, get to join us right at the start. So Amy, I think I'm gonna say thank you so much for this. It was a wonderful conversation. And have you finish um, by running your book trailer again. It's so wonderful and everybody needs to see that. <laughs> okay, we'll do that again. I'm, I hope my friends aren't just so tired of this book trailer. Oh, I'll, it's just so entertaining. I don't think they could be. I have to just open it. I'm sorry. Give me two right. seconds to get that up for you. Um, no, it was a lot of fun to make. And before I hit play, I will just say, Pamela, thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Well, and thank you for being our inaugural author at the virtual Literature Lovers Night Out. And I guess it's Literature Lovers Lunchtime Out now. 
Yes, exactly. And I would just say for anyone who already bought my book, buy a different book at Excelsior Bay or Valley Bookseller, but buy, buy something from them. Support wonderful bookstores who are so good to their readers and so good to their authors, and we're grateful. So oh, thank you so much. Here's the video. <laughs> Okay, this is funny. Somebody just wrote that they think that my book is really autobiographical. That's ridiculous. But isn't it a book about New Yorkers who have a house in Connecticut? And all the adult kids move back home? What? No, yes, but they're twins. She has a daughter. I don't have a daughter. Yeah, but isn't the house room like completely falling apart? Don't they bring all their pets? Doesn't the mom drink a lot of wine? No, this is fiction. I'm a novelist. <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. We appreciated having a live audience today. And I, again, encourage you to pre-order your book from either Excelsior Bay Books or Valley Bookseller here in Minnesota, and you will get a signed book plate and bookmark from the fabulous and talented Amy Popel. Thank you so much for joining us today, Amy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Stay safe and healthy out there in Connecticut. Will do. <laughs> Bye, everybody. We'll see you July 22nd with author Stephen Kiernan and Universe of Two. Take care. Bye.